Hello, Year 8, and we're going to be looking this week at a gothic story. So um, it's called The Monkey's Paw. Some of you may know it. Um, so part of the task today, so I'm going to read part one um, in this setting, and there's some questions to go with it. But there's also a bit of research um, so about what is gothic, so um, different supernatural elements and mystery um, so other famous novels characters you may have heard of dracula frankenstein jekyll and hyde um, they're all from similar time periods sort of victorian time and this is set uh, around that time as well so uh, the monkey's poor I'll read it and then I'll go through the questions and then in the next film session I'll go through the answers and read the final bits of the story. So part one. Without, the night was cold and wet, but in the small parlour of Laburnum Villa the blinds were drawn and the fire burned brightly. Father and son were at chess. The former, who possessed ideas about the game involving radical changes, putting his king into such sharp and unnecessary perils that it even provoked comment from the white-haired old lady knitting placidly by the fire. Hark at the wind, said Mrs. White, who, having seen a fatal mistake after it was too late, was amiably desirous of presenting, preventing his son from seeing it. I'm listening, said the latter, grimly surveying the board as he stretched out his hand. Deck. I should hardly think that he'd come tonight, said his father, with his hand poised over the board. Mate, replied the son. That's the worst of living so far out, bawled Mr. White, with sudden and unlooked for violence. Of all the beastly, slushy, out of the way places to live in, this is the worst. Pathways are bog and the roads are torrent. I don't know what people are thinking about. I suppose because only two houses on the road are let, they think it doesn't matter. Never mind, dear, said his wife soothingly. Perhaps you'll win the next one. Mr White looked up sharp, sharply, just in time to intercept a knowing glance between mother and the words died away on his lips, and he hid a guilty grin in his thin grey beard. There he is, said Herbert White, as the gate banged too loudly, to loudly and heavy footsteps came towards the door. The old man rose with hospitable haste, and, opening the door, was heard condoling with the new arrival. The new arrival also condoled with himself. So that Mrs. White said tut tut and roughly and coughed gently as her husband entered the room, followed by a tall burly man, beady of eye and rubicund of visage. Sergeant Major Morris, he said, introducing himself. The Sergeant Major shook hands and, taking the proffered seat by the fire, watched contentedly while his host got out whiskey and tumblers and set a small copper kettle on the fire. At the third glass his eyes got brighter and he began to talk, the little family circle regarding with eager interest this visitor from distant parts, as he squared his broad shoulders in the chair and spoke of strange scenes and doughty deeds, of wars and plagues and strange people. Twenty-one years of it, said Mr. White, nodding at his wife and son. When he went away, he was a slip of a youth in the warehouse. Now look at him. He don't look to have taken much harm, said Mrs. White politely. I'd like to go to India myself, said the old man, just to look around a bit, you know. Better where you are, said Sergeant Major, shaking his head. He put down the empty glass and sighing softly, took it again. I should like to see the old temples and fakirs and jugglers, said the old man. 
What was that you started telling me the other day about a monkey's paw or something, Morris? Nothing, said the soldier hastily. Leastways, nothing worth hearing. Monkey's paw, said Mrs White curiously. Well, it's just a bit of what you might call magic, perhaps, said the sergeant major offhandedly. His three listeners leaned forward eagerly. The visitor absent-mindedly put his empty glass to his lips and then set it down again. His host filled it for him. To look at, said the sergeant major, fumbling in his pocket, it's just an ordinary little paw dried to a mummy. He took something out of his pocket and proffered it. Mrs White drew back with a grimace, but her son, taking it, examined it curiously. And what is there special about it? inquired Mr White as he took it from his son, and, having examined it, placed it upon the table. It had a spell put on it by an old fakir, said the sergeant major, a very holy man. He wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives and that those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow. He put a spell on it so that three separate men could each have three wishes from it. His manner was so impressive that his hearers were conscious that their light laughter jarred somewhat. Well, why don't you have three, sir? said Herbert White cleverly. The soldier regarded him in a way that middle age is wont to regard presumptuous youth. I have, he said quietly, and his blotchy face whitened. And did you really have the three wishes granted? asked Mrs White. I did, said the sergeant major, and his glass tapped against his strong teeth. And has anybody else wished? inquired the old lady. The first man had his three wishes, yes, was the reply. I don't know what the first two were, but the third was for death. That's how I got the poor. His tones were so grave that a hush fell upon the group. If you've had your three wishes, it's no good to you now then, Morris, said the old man at last. What do you keep it for? The soldier shook his head. Fancy, I suppose, he said slowly. If you could have another three wishes, said the old man, eyeing him keenly, would you have them? I don't know, said the other. I don't know. He took the paw and dangling it between his front finger and thumb, suddenly threw it upon the fire. White, with a slight cry, stooped down and snatched it off. Better let it burn, said the soldier solemnly. If you don't want it, Morris, said the old man, give it to me. I won't, said his friend doggedly. I threw it on the fire. If you keep it, don't blame me for what happens. Pitch it on the fire again, like a sensible man. The other shook his head and examined his new possession closely. How do you do it? he inquired. Hold it up in your right hand and wish aloud, said the sergeant major. But I warn you of the consequences. Sounds like the Arabian Nights, said Mrs White, as she rose and began to set the supper. Don't you think you might wish for four pairs of hands for me? Her husband drew the talisman from his pocket, and then all three burst into laughter as the sergeant major, with a look of alarm on his face, caught him by the arm. If you must wish, he said gruffly, wish for something sensible. Mr White dropped it back into his pocket, and placing chairs, motioned his friend to the table. In the business of supper, the talisman was partly forgotten, and afterward the three sat listening in an enthralled fashion to a second instalment of the soldier's adventures in India. If the tale about the monkey paw is not more truthful than those he has been telling us, said Herbert as the door closed behind Herbert, just in time for him to catch the 
in our brain, we shan't make much out of it. Did you give him anything for it, father? inquired Mrs. White, regarding her husband playfully. A trifle, said he, colouring slightly. He didn't want it, but I made him take it, and he pressed me again to throw it away. Likely, said Herbert, with pretended horror. Why, we're going to be rich and famous and happy. Wish to be an emperor, father, to begin with, then you can't be henpecked. He darted round the table, pursued by the maligned Mrs. White armed with an anti macassar Mr. White took the paw from his pocket and eyed it dubiously. I don't know what to wish for, and that's a fact, he said slowly. It seems to me I've got all I want. If you only cleared the house, you'd be quite happy, wouldn't you? said Herbert, with his hand on his shoulder. Well, wish for two hundred pounds, then. That'll just do it. His father, smiling shamefacedly at his own credulity, held up the talisman as his son, with a solemn face, somewhat marred by a wink at his mother, sat down at the piano and struck a few impressive chords. I wish for two hundred pounds, said the old man gently. A fine crash from the piano greeted the words, interrupted by a shuddering cry from the old man. His wife and son ran toward him. It moved, he cried, with a glance of disgust at the object as it lay on the floor as I wished it twisted in my hands like a snake. Well, I don't see the money, said his son, as he picked it up and placed it on the table, and I bet I never shall. It must have been your fancy, father, said his wife, regarding him, an regarding him anxiously. He shook his head. Never mind, though, no harm done. It gave me a shock all the same. They sat down by the fire again while the two men finished their pipes. Outside, the wind was higher than ever, and the old man started nervously at the sound of a door banging upstairs. A silence, unusual and depressing, settled upon all three, which lasted until the old couple rose to retire for the night. I expect you'll find the cat tied up in a ba big bag in the middle of your bed, said Herbert, as he bade them good night and something horrible squatting up on top of the wardrobe and watching you as you pocket your ill-gotten gains. He sat alone in the darkness, gazing at the dying fire and seeing faces in it. The last face was so horrible and so simian that he gazed at it in amazement. It got so vivid that, with a little uneasy laugh, he felt on the table for a glass containing a little water to throw over it. His hand grasped the monkey's paw, and with a little shiver, he wiped his hand on his coat and went up to bed. So, um, that's the first part of the story. So, we have the White family, and so we have Mr. White's friend, Sergeant Major Morris, um, coming and telling them stories about India. So at this time period, um, India was a really exotic, far off and uh, enigmatic, mysterious location with you know, the tigers and the elephants and the jewels and the spices. Um, so lots of literature is influenced by India and sort of the mythical, mystical thing. in this undiscovered jungle beautiful land so um questions so the first thing is some research so explain how the opening of the monkey's paw fits with each of the features of the gothic genre so do a bit of research about the gothic genre um have a look at the different novels and stories and things so one of the features is Another of the features is isolated setting. So isolated means that uh, they're on their own. So they're um, distant, far away from a lot of other people. Uh, so we've got darkness, old abandoned buildings, treacherous weather conditions, bad weather, and frightening or mysterious characters. So 
the whip element is called the monkey spore, fitting the uh, elements or features of the Gothic genre. So, like I said, do a bit of research about Gothic and other stories and then get your answers. So, questions are here. So, after you've read the opening, so part one, um, I'd like you to have a think about these questions. So, use your inference skills and your uh, knowledge of the text to answer these questions. So finding the information and thinking about it. So what is the atmosphere like in the White family's home at the beginning of the story? I'll give you a quotation to prove what you say. So what atmosphere, what emotions do you think? Uh, two, so write a list of everything we learn about Sergeant Major Morris. And how did you feel when he entered into the story? Three, so the writer gives the reader hints that the monkey's port is dangerous. We find two different examples of this and explain how they hint at the danger. So how is it a hint? So four, how does the setting outside contrast with the setting inside? So the weather outside and what's happening inside with the family. And then why do you think the characters feel unsettled at the end of part one? And then a holy man put a spell on the monkey's paw because, quote, he wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives and that those who interfered with it did so their sorrow. So can you explain what that means? So what do you th ha think happens next in the story? So this money, do you think it appears? So there we have our questions. So I hope you like this style and I've enjoyed the first part of the story and I look forward to reading your answers. So like I said, we will look at session, uh, in session two, we'll look at the answers to those questions and I'll read the second and third parts of the story. Thank you.